Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Von Trigger has in depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage Studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Von Trigger. Well, 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 welcome back to Rock the Stage Show. It's Sunday night, 7 p.m. Check your watches. Yeah, we're back once again, streaming on YouTube and on the PPN network. And we're in 17 different countries now, going global more and more each and every week, helping you learn about amazing celebrities, authors, speakers, and what they do, why they do it, and some of them even, even crazy stories about why they do it. We're going to have a great time here tonight because we're going to have a returning guest here this evening. Uh, one of our uh, favorite shows of those past year, of 2023. Um, we're going to let him drop back in and have a little bit more because he's got exciting stuff going on. But let me ask you this question here. What if you could live the life of your dreams? The life of your dreams. I'm talking about maybe become an actor, maybe become a Broadway performer, maybe become a singer, maybe win award-winning roles and iconic roles in film or TV or musical like my guest says here tonight. What would it be like if you could come full circle then in life and move back to where you lived, back to the East Coast, and then be a director reprising the role that you lived and do it all over again and work with a bunch of new actors? What would it be like if you could live that type of life? Well, tonight we're going to get into that with the uh, actor, the fun guy, returning guest, Joe Barbara. And I'm just going to bring Joe in because I don't have anything else to say about you, Joe. <laughs> Hi, Rich. Great to see you again. Good to see um, you, my friend. You have been a busy, busy man since we last yeah. spoke. And uh, life just seems to be rolling really good for you, doesn't it? Well, you know, uh, yes, yes. I, I have to be very, very thankful. Thank, thankful to the the big guy upstairs for um, for everything that I have in life and and everything that uh, you know that he he blesses us with. So yes, I'm, well, I'm very grateful. Beautiful wife, beautiful family. You're right. out there enjoying it all, having a good time, and your social posts pulled me in immediately again, which I love watching. But you said. Just when you thought I was out, they pulled yeah. me back in. <laughs> Tell right? me how this went down because now you're directing and right. you're playing the role of Sonny again. How cool is that? Yeah. Well, it, it is all thanks to my friend, my wonderful, good, longtime friend, Janine Molinari. Um, Janine uh, directed at the Seven Angels Theater in Waterbury, Connecticut, has directed there for many years and is sort of a staple there. And, um, and Janine and I have worked together for years. We've directed together before. So uh, when they decided to do a Bronx Tale, she, uh, she was directing it and she called me up and said, would you want to do this with me? And, uh, you know, it was an offer I couldn't refuse, as they so, say. For those who don't know the Bronx Tale, it's based on a critically acclaimed play inspired now by the classic film. So you may have seen that version of it. Streetwise musical. It takes you to the stoops and the streets of the Bronx in the 1960s. A young man is caught between father that he loves and the mob boss he would love to be. How cool is that? I know, right? And it's about respect, loyalty, love, family, all that wrapped together. Now, you've played Sonny before at an extensive run. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn from that experience of playing Sonny then versus Sonny now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, The first 40 or so times I played Sonny, um, I started off in this production. I was part of the uh, original, the original, the world premiere of the musical at the Paper Mill Playhouse. I was part of the original Broadway cast and I did the entire Broadway run and then did the national tour. Um, when I started off, uh, Nick Cordero, who um, rest his soul, um, great man, great actor, great singer, fantastic voice, had a rock and roll voice that just, you know, you would die for. Um, and uh, we lost Nick to COVID, unfortunately. Mm. Um, but he was the original, uh, he was originally cast as Sonny and played the original, uh, played Sonny in the original production on Broadway. Um, so I was, I was his cover. I was in the show. I played Carmine. 
Um, and I played the lead biker and I had about 15 or 16 costume changes throughout the show. So I actually had, it was much more exhausting to do that track than it is to play Sonny, believe me. Um, but Nick was the original Sonny. So the, the first 40 or so times I went on, um, once I took over the role on Broadway and even the times that he was out, um, you know, you're basically there to just sort of fill the other guy's shoes. <laughs> you're not there to sort of reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, you just kind of keep the show going and and fill all the gaps. Um, then when I got, when I was cast in the national tour, um, it really became my role. Yeah. And and I have to say it was only about a month or so between the, the end of the Broadway run and the beginning of the national tour. So not that much had really changed. Right. Now right. I've had distance, you know, another, whatever, four years or so, um, since five years since I've done it. So now um, it's sort of a new approach. Now it feels like I've gotten rid of some of those habits and and I can just, you know, um, allow whatever, you know, whatever impulses that feel right, you know, to take over. And you're not trying to, you're not trying to uh, duplicate what you've done before. Well, and and I've heard- I think it's funny I do think it's funnier. There's moments that I think are funnier. <laughs> Not you. I can't see you finding anything funny. Um, I have heard actors say when they come back to a role, it's putting the skin back on, but they have to relearn the skin. Did you have to go through that a little bit? Did you have no. to relearn who Sonny was again? No. no. Really? No. Did you no. put it on and just go, I'm ready? Yeah. <laughs> As you put the suit on, you're ready to go. Um yeah, no, I didn't. I never felt that. And I've heard of other people doing that. I, frankly, I can't understand that. To me, I have, I guess I have good long term memory. Um, <laughs> once it's well, in, once it's there, it's there. It doesn't mean you don't allow for new things to affect you, but it's not like I have to go back and rediscover something uh, unless I did something wrong the first time. Um, well, so, no, or, it's, it's there. Or how much is Sunny? Joe and how much is Joe Sonny has, has that line blurred, but you did it for so long. Well, I, I never shot anybody. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> See anybody's listening. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I will say this, you know, what's interesting. Um, Sonny, w one of the things about Sonny that, that is, maybe overlooked, um, yeah. maybe not overlooked. It, it certainly Chaz wouldn't overlook it, but the fact that he, he saw himself as a teacher of this boy and he saw himself as sort of a role. He knew he was sort of a role model in a, in an odd way. Yeah. Um, so he wanted to impart knowledge and leave something behind. And I think on those levels, um, I think I can identify with that quite a bit, you know, especially, especially being five years, uh, removed from the last time I've done it and working with a lot of younger people. Um, there's a lot that I would like to, uh, leave behind and a lot of, um, examples that I'd like to set, um, about the way I think things should be done. And mm. I mean, that's really, you know, that's not to be arrogant cause I'm not always right. Right. But, but you have to believe if you don't believe in the way you think, then right. you're good as the way you think. You know? Well, that takes us back to our first conversation we had you on. When you did leave Vegas, you came home after 9-11 yeah. and you said, I have to do something for my neighborhood. Right. We were actually in Nashville when 9-11 when okay. happened. But yeah, but yeah, I had to come back. We, we, I had to come back and we, uh, we moved into, you know, Battery Park City right across the street from, from the hole that was, uh, created from um, the World Trade Center and um, and became part of the community emergency response team. And, and um, you know, I, I had friends. My, my closest friend was at the time was uh, was uh, a police officer and was on top of the pile pulling out body parts like the next night. So the night on September 12th, you know, so um, I felt like, man, everybody's doing something. What am I doing? So we went back and we uh, we decided to, you know, revitalize the neighborhood and sort of bring the neighborhood back or at least oh, you stepped up big yeah so the fact that you do want to make a statement you do want to have an mm -hmm. impact you're not just oh, an no. actor singer oh, you're, no. you're a guy that really cares and wants to step up well you know it's funny you talk about that i'll tell you i have to put the water down sorry um i was thinking of this about 15 minutes before before we started this conversation 
when I was in Las Vegas, um, I was in Vegas for eight years and I was doing Jersey Boys. And there, you know, Vegas is the home of Nellis Air Force Base. Yeah. And uh, and Nellis is the, oh, I'm going to get this messed up, the Warfare Command Center. I forgot. I forgot the, the, the official term of it, whatever. But they train fighter pilots. Yeah. And it's also the home of the, of the Thunderbirds. And we would have in the audience um, at Jersey Boys quite often the command, <clears throat> the commander of the Nellis Air Force Base. He was a two-star general. His name was General Bill Hyatt. And what an outstanding, just strong um, leader this guy was. And I got to know him on a personal level. Um, because he would come to the show often and then, you know, we met after the show and then he would invite my family and I out to, to the, uh, air force base and give us tours. A couple of, actually he invited several of the, the cast members, but one time he invited just me and my family and my boys and, you know, took them on tours and let them sit in the cockpit of, of like a mock cockpit of F-16. It was amazing. Um, and I used to say to him, man, like what you do is so important and I have such respect. My dad was in the army. My dad was was in the Korean War, and uh, and I'm so proud of that. And sometimes I feel like, you know, what did I do for my country or for my my world, my society? And um, and I would say this to, to General Hyatt, and he would say, "You have no idea. Like we need, uh, you know, people in our position need what you do just as much as you need what we do." And I don't, I don't, I always disputed that <laughs> no him, not me no you don't need us as much you might need us a little bit but we don't not nearly as much as we need you but um but anyway so it feels it, there's got to be that kind of uh you know civic duty i guess uh, well and there is something again we've seen so many movies people have talked about it but there's that new yorker thing yeah new yorkers are new yorkers and we care and we're right is is is, is that a saying or is that a true thing well i think there's so i I think it's true of New York, but I, I don't think it's it's any more true of New York than anywhere. I think if God forbid some tragedy uh, happened in you know in, in Dayton, Ohio, that you know everybody would that, that Dayton would come together and and help each other out and bond together. I mean, look at what happened. You know, Boston Strong in the in the yeah. uh, you know the the um, the marathon, uh, yeah. the bombing, and all of that. I mean. So I believe that look what happens in Texas and Houston when when the hurricanes hit and I mean so I think every community will come together when when needed. Um, so you I don't know. You might be at the forefront. You mean you might be up front leading people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's true. But um, but uh, yeah. So I think we all. I think you know that's that's just America. I think those are good-hearted, hardworking, you know, responsible Americans. So you do mention Jersey Boys, 10 years, Las Vegas run, on the strip, Tony Award winning musical. I'm curious, did you pay attention to what the directors were doing? Were you understudying oh. and learning and observing and gleaning? And if so, what oh. did you get out of that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Because, you know, to be honest with you, Rich, I didn't think that this acting thing was necessarily going to last all that long. <laughs> Um, I didn't, I, when I was a kid, I would start putting movies together and I, I'd shoot little short films with my friends and, and put little shows together because it, that was more exciting to me than being in them. I put myself in them, but, but I had to put them together. That was much more fun. Um, so I've sort of always envisioned myself as, as a director before I envisioned myself as an actor. <laughs> so, <laughs> and look how that turned out. Like you said, they pull me back in again. Well, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the famous line from Godfather Three, <laughs> the only famous line from Godfather. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, but uh, Janine asked me to to do this with her, and I could not have been happier. Yeah. So now you are directing. You're replaying Sunny. So what have all those years taught you to help you to take on this new team? Because there's a bunch of new people you're working with. Yeah. It's it's a little bit of a different mindset because you know well here's what's interesting about the whole thing so we when we did it on Broadway we rehearsed for I want to say six weeks I think six weeks of rehearsal and then a month of previews before opening okay um with with professionals who do this and nothing else 
this is what they do for a living and they are the best of the best and they are the most trained six weeks four weeks of of previews now you go <laughs> to waterbury connecticut and you have some people that are really really dedicated you have other people that you know have to work their their nine to five job and then come to rehearsal when they can yes and you have two weeks and three days of three days of tech <laughs> two and a half weeks so you have to do so much you have less time on every front whether yeah. it's the actual you know calendar dates whether it's the amount of rehearsal time hours per day you can get with people and the fact that people are you know your mind your mind is amazing we all of our minds are amazing we can train them to do something you can train some a mind to learn dialogue quickly you can train a mind to learn music quickly you can train a mind to learn dance steps quickly but you know if you're talking about a, a guy who you know maybe uh you know runs a funeral home in during the day you know he's his mind is not you know primed to learn music so you're asking people to do things that they are not incredibly uh you know set up to do right and many of them have risen to the occasion so well it's it's amazing but it's a it's a much taller order in in a lot of ways than it was in new york so before i bring in an, another part of yeah. your team seven angels theater have you ever done anything on stage there it was a, that was that a new environment for you brand new environment brand new environment i had never been there before i had never um done anything worked with them although like i said my friend janine had worked there quite a bit so she sort of was uh was the conduit was my liaison so i'm like how does this work you know, how do we, you know, for example, the gunshot is not a real gunshot. It's a sound effect. Is that, do we have to do that? We, you know, she's like, no, that's right. how you have to do it here. You know, so she was basically my, my interpreter as well. And, uh, and sort of set me straight on the ropes of, of how things work in a, in a smaller theater, in a smaller town, um, with different rules and regulations. Well, we're going to bring in one of your actors. I'm going to let you introduce Keegan to everybody and Keegan, welcome to the show here today. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. And uh, Joe, you you do the proper introduction. This is your so, guy. So this is this is Keegan Smith. Now I have to tell you. So Keegan walked into the audition, and he number one, he nailed it. Um, and we and Keegan plays Crazy Mario um, in the show. And this weekend he'll also be playing Carmine, which was the role that I created and originated um, in, in the in the uh, original Broadway show. So um, he's taken over that role. Um, but here's the, here's the deal with Keegan. Ke Keegan's young and he's incredibly talented, but more than that, he's just a, he's a down to earth guy that gets it and does things the right way. And, and I'll tell you one thing about him. There was one, uh, uh, there was one rehearsal early on and I don't remember what it was, but something went wrong in the scene. Like something went terribly wrong. And it was a note or something that was just completely sour, or it was a, a moment that was missed, whatever. And we're like, what the heck was that? And then Keek stands up and he's like, that was me. That was me. My bad. My fault. I did it. You know, no he owned it. <laughs> he, he completely owned it. No excuses, no pointing fingers, nothing. And I'm and I have such respect for that. Um, because we're losing that in our never mind theater in the world today, you know, yeah. we're just yeah. losing that. Look, once somebody does that, you're done. What else is there to say? He's like, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. Got it. And I'm like, that's that's the key. Never mind theater, never mind show business. That's a key to life. You know, you own it, you learn from it, and you admit it and you go, okay, I'll do better. And and that's what this guy is. So it more than just the the talent. It's just, um, it's a mentality that I think um, that I'd, I'd love to see catch on. <laughs> wow, Keegan, how do you feel about all that coming from the director? That's high praise, you know, I appreciate it. It's, uh, <laughs> that's just a holdover from growing up uh, a baseball player with the parents I had, you know, it was just like, if you flub up a ground ball, you know, get a next play, that's me. So that's awesome. How has that helped you stepping into acting? And is this your first acting gig? No. So this is my second professional acting gig. 
but I've been in theater since I was eight because my parents would be going to rehearsals at our church. Uh, we had, we had, we would do musicals out of our church. Yeah. And so, you know, they, my sister and I would be at rehearsal and the director would be like, I mean, what do we do with these kids instead of them just sitting around all the time? So they would, you know, throw us in on the stage, run across the stage, create a scene. Um, and so that's how I first got started was, was my parents, but I was doing both baseball and then volleyball in high school, uh, in college in theater at the same time. So, so did all three of us start in church doing plays? Uh, I did. Yeah, school, I yes. did. Okay, good. I was school, <laughs> church, but the school, yeah. <laughs> my first play was our town, my first semi-professional. Seriously, Keegan. We did our town. Yep. We did really? our town at my church. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> my younger brother and I got to play the brother kid roles, uh, which was really kind of interesting. So we, practiced together and played together and we got on stage together. It was very interesting. Either one of us dropped a line, the other one would pick up the line. <laughs> so we kind of blurred the characters <laughs> into one at times. How did it go for you, Keegan? Did, did that kind of get you going as a kid? Did you get curious in acting or was it just kind of a fun thing to do at church? It was something to do. And then middle school is when the school starts doing theater. So then I was like, okay, I'll do the drama club. And it really didn't hit me until probably college was when I was like, oh, this is something I could do for life and try to do professionally. So did you have to audition for Joe for this? Did you have to actually come to a tryout? Oh, yeah. So I, <laughs> so I grew up 20 minutes from Seven Angels Theater. So oh, wow. It's it has loomed large in my life, and so I thought it a missed opportunity if I didn't at least try. So I showed up to the audition, and yeah, I, I sang. I sang. I only have eyes for you. And How was that, Joe? Joe, what was that like when he stepped up and did it? Transparency, my friend. <laughs> I, gotta be honest, I don't. I I don't remember what he sang. Um, I don't remember. I would not have remembered it if he hadn't said it, but I remember him reading the Mario monologue and that's, that's what did it for us. Cause he, he must've like sang well and he must've sung well. And, uh, and we just, okay, let's see if he can read because um, there's a lot of guys, I gotta be honest with you. There's a lot of guys that, you know, musicals really rely on uh, obviously a lot on your voice, but there's a lot of guys that can sing well and, and not that many that bring that sort of, um, uh, reality and a little bit of an edge and a little bit of grit to a character. And there's, there's a lot of guys in musical theater that, that fall into that category. And, and Keegan broke that mold. So Keegan, how did you prepare to step up for that moment? Did you watch the movie? Did you, how did uh, you get into it? No, I didn't want to jinx it. So I didn't want to watch the movie until I got the part. Wow. Yeah. Yes. And um, so I don't know. I mean, I grew up, with my neighborhood was i think there's 10 of us all guys all within three years of each other we grew up playing stickball having airsoft gun wars you know like i grew up in a neighborhood that i likened to belmont avenue it was when summer would hit you know our parents would be like all right go outside we'll see you when the sun comes down come back home very kind of old school so Love it. I, I just, it was me talking to my friends. It was in the neighborhood on Hummiston Brook. So, Joe, did you know that before no. you said, boom, you're in? Or did you find no. out that afterwards that he had that in his DNA? No, I found that afterwards. No, we didn't know. But you could just see the way he did the scene. I mean, he just, he nailed the scene. You know, there weren't many people that nailed the scene. Let's, let's be honest with you, you know. So, um, it was a, it was kind of a no brainer. He just, he got it. You know, you could, he got it. It, it. Singing sometimes is like, you check the box. Can he sing? Can he carry the tune? Does he have, you know, does it sound good? Great. You check the box. Now can he play the character? You know, and, and he did. Can you walk and chew gum at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and then 
as far as Carmine, the, the funny thing was, so we cast a guy, and, and Carmine should be older than Keegan, let's be honest, right? <laughs> Carmine should be a middle-aged guy at least. Um, and we have a guy, we call him Phil the Undertaker, um, Phil Myrano, who literally owns a funeral home in, in Waterbury. Um, but uh, but he, he, this only happens in. <laughs> in, in I'm enjoying this so much right now. <laughs> um, so Phil actually also does on the side of his of his funeral <laughs> home duties. He's also an Elvis impersonator, <laughs> and and um, he was he was known to Samina De Laurentiis, um, who's the artistic director of the theater, who who also you know invited me to do this so i want to thank samina but um he was known to samina and she kind of encouraged us you got to look at my friend phil for this role so we looked at phil for carmine and he was good and uh but the only hitch with phil is like well i can't be there for the last weekend what do you mean you can't be here for the last weekend well i gotta i do elvis impersonations and i got a gig in texas i'm like you what are you kidding me Seriously, that's a joke. He's like, no, no, no. It's my best friend's wedding, and I promised him I'd be there. You're doing an Elvis impersonation for a wedding in Texas, so you can't perform for the last four shows. <laughs> he says, yeah, that's it. you got to be kidding me. So, so um, you know, we we'd kind of thought some contingency plans. What could we do for the last four performances to, you know, to fill the role of Carmine as well? And about a week ago um we had a rehearsal and keegan stepped up and i gotta tell you phil phil's a great guy and he really worked his butt off he's fantastic but he's he's got some some physical quirks some vocal quirks and he's very specific he he's he's very specific um and keegan stepped up and did a dead on phil impersonation in the role and just his dexterity that that keegan could just pull that out i was like oh my god maybe keegan should be doing this so then we had a rehearsal where he didn't do phil and just did his own version of carmine and i was like oh my gosh this this kid's amazing he was better than i ever was doing carmine <laughs> so um so you know it's he's just I, I have a lot of respect for the kid all right so first of all you have the Elvis Undertaker, just, just so we're clear on that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and we have a better Carmine. And I was going to ask you that. So, Joe, first, what's it like to have someone else take on a character that you helped develop? What's it like to literally say, do it your way, but sit there and watch it? Well, let's be honest. I was, I was half joking when I said he was better than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have to say, when I saw Keegan do it in the rehearsal, like it came out of nowhere. I was sitting there with the biggest smile on my face because it's not about, it's not about who's better. It, that makes no difference. Um, as a director, I was just thrilled that we had a Carmine that could do it that well. You know what I'm saying? That, that moment is really important to me. That moment in the show is really important to the, to the show and the meaning of the show. And when he stepped up and did it, I was like, you know, so many times you get performers that are good, but it's not exactly the way I would recommend doing it. But, you know, they have, kind of have their own take and you don't want to be, you know, micromanage every little thing. Right. So yeah. He came up and I was like, that's, I wouldn't change anything in that. And when you have a moment like that, it's just, I just sat there with a huge smile on my face. So Keegan, what did it feel like to know you're stepping into his role? The guy directing you, <laughs> stepping in his role, any pressure? Oh my God. So the respect that Joe is outlining that he has for me, I mean, take that and multiply it by however much and it's right back at Joe. To having the honor of working with Joe and, and working with the group we have has been an experience I wouldn't trade for anything. So getting to step in is the pressure of, oh, you know, he did it. And then I mean, Joe Pesci did it in the movie. That's like a pretty good Joe Joe combo, you know? <laughs> but it's more so, you know, it's pressure, but it's also excitement that this person that you revere so much would 
entrust that responsibility with you. Yeah. You know, especially given I'm probably 20 years, 30 years too young for the part, but knowing yeah, that. Yeah, take it easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do they gray you up? Do they do a little gray and they, do they put some lines? We haven't done it yet. So, uh, no, we. I don't know if we're going to get be able to do the gray. We'll see. We may do a little bit. We may just put a hat on him or something. Yeah. Uh, he just he embodies it. I, I'm not so sure that's the most important part of it. You know. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. It's, so uh, it's a blast. It's a blast. Well, no, and so when we when you do this and again, I remember doing it. I loved it. But when you do a long run, I did ten weeks. After a while, you start doing little ad libs. You do things to keep yourself on your toes during a show. As a director, Joe. Oh. Do you do do you do do you want them to have a little don't start, with me, with that. Don't start with me? Don't start with me. Really? Not, I told you what to, done. <laughs> done. No, you you gotta keep a I mean, in my opinion, you keep a, a very tight leash. You do a tight rein on everything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because people will start to every all of a sudden now we're embellishing and the embellishments are not part of the character, they're not part of the show, they don't always fit. On, on very rare occasions, you can maybe find something that works, but nine times out of 10, it doesn't work. If it had worked, we would have suggested it the first time. No, stop it. No, now people get comfortable. Now they think they, everybody's a director. No, knock it off. Just do what we did. So Keegan, Joe's not listening. He's not here right now. But right. When, when you're on stage, when you're in character, have you had moments where you know it's a little bit off? And you have to pull it back in the redirect. Someone missed a line, missed a step. There was a gap that didn't happen. Is, has, has that happened? And how do you handle that? I think the biggest danger we have is laughing because the, the doo-wop guys, which is the main group that I spend time with, um, you know, Raul Calderon is our C, but we also have Rocco, JT, Samuele. Like those are the doo-wop guys. And we're such a close group you know, close knit group of guys that we look at each other and we'll want to laugh because we've developed our inside jokes on certain lines and certain <laughs> steps. So it's not so much, Oh, I missed that step, which they will let you know. I think that's the best part about that group is we have grown so close. I mean, I just did the math yesterday. We rehearsed over 130 hours in those 15 days of rehearsal. Wow. And but we also, we, you know, like we have film of our dances and it was like game tape. Like I just remember Rocco being like, and Rocco's from Italy. Rocco and Samuele, born and raised in Italy, they're here doing this show. And so Rocco would just be like, he has no time for our American sensibilities. He's like, your arms were wrong. That was wrong. This is good, but that was wrong. And it, it's the best though. <laughs> and I have to say, you know, like it, Ke Keegan is a is a representation from the cast. I, I obviously couldn't bring all twenty five other people on, but, yeah. um, but it, it is an amazing group, and and they're very dedicated. and uh, And those guys, it it warms my heart to see how close they've all gotten uh, to to be with each other. So um, it's it's a really an amazing group. Keegan, before I let you go here, what has been your biggest takeaway learning moment from working with Joe, from being a part of this? Because you are rising, you are getting into this craft, and I'm, I'm really curious, what's been your biggest aha for you? I think my biggest lesson that I've learned from Joe is how to balance being a family man as well as a performer. Mm -hmm. um, so... My parents have been married for 33 years this year. Um, I have three siblings and family was a central part of who I am growing up and it's and it remains so. And this is a crazy business and everyone knows that, but being able to lean on someone like Joe who has, you know, the stable family, three kids, wife, and has been able to act on the highest stage, literally living out my life dream. It's a, been a great role model to illustrate what I should be doing and, and how to handle everything. Follow up question on that, Keegan. What would you say to an aspiring young actor? Look back at yourself 
seven years ago, five years ago, what would you say to a mini version of you? I'll look back at myself like eight months ago and I'll say, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the biggest piece of advice I would have is, um, you know, everyone says that you have to be comfortable with hearing no. I think you have to be comfortable with hearing nothing because a lot of these auditions are virtual and you throw them out there and you never hear anything back. And so I think just trust yourself, you know, and have fun. The minute that you're stressing and you're, you're starting to go inward, I suck. I'm not good enough. It's not the point. This is theater. We get to sing and dance and people pay us to do that. I don't think there's anything cooler in the world. So, yeah. Keegan Smith, thanks for taking the time for joining us today on Rock to Stage. It's been great to have you along and adding your flavor into all of this. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. So, all right. It's back to us now, Joe. Here we go. We're going down to the finish line, my friend. Yeah. yeah. You just heard him talk about his growth, his learning, yeah. go all the way back when you began. Mm. Were those some of the learning points too, or was it a different time, a different place? Well, you know what? It's great that you say different time, different place. I think it, I think in our world it was. So when I look back, I look back at, yeah, I didn't hear from auditions like Keegan said, yeah. and you just go, all right, well, I guess that's over next one, you know? Um, what did I do? What could I do, have done better? And there's times when I'd have auditions where I thought I was brilliant and didn't hear anything. I'm like, well, I, I wouldn't have changed anything. So the heck with that, you know? Um, but I think there was, and I think to some extent, I hope that, um, Keegan and some of the people in the cast maybe responded to the fact that I tried to bring some of that back and, mm. and not, not be afraid to say that stunk. What were you doing? What were you thinking? What are you thinking? You know, it's not a personal attack. It's simply just the facts. We have very limited time to get this to a level where we're all going to be proud of it. So that's not working. So let's do something else. And to say that's not working and that's not going to help us and that's not the direction we got to go shouldn't be offensive. It's just a fact. It's a simple, honest, you know, assessment. So knowing you, I think I know the answer. I, I, I just want to. The trend is to take some of these classic mu films, musicals, and reimagine them today. Mm -hmm. You're doing a 1960 Bronx Tale. Yeah. Is there a way to reimagine that? Or are you like me? Like when it comes to baseball, I'm a purist. Come, yeah. They never should have put the lights in. They never should have put the lights in. <laughs> <laughs> you should have put that out there. So right. when, when it comes to this, should we be reimagining some of these things that are truly timeless? It's family. It's the 60s. It's timeless things that aren't here anymore. I, I don't know if you can reimagine a Bronx tale. I mean, because it's got so many critical, colorful elements that make it what it is. Um, you know, but people reimagine, you know, all kinds of shows. Uh, My Fair Lady in, in Chicago or whatever. A million. And... I mean, in and of itself, I don't think there's, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you might want to bring a different take on something. Um, I always had the, it, well, I won't even get into that, but I mean, I had thoughts of doing some of that, but um, in and of itself, it's fine. It depends on what you're trying to re, what, you're, what you're trying to accomplish by reimagining right. it. I mean, are you just taking it to some ridiculous level that like, what's the point of that? You know, what is the point? Joe Barber, it's been great to have you back here again. We're going to put your IMDb back up here again. Last time we talked, I said, what's next for you? And you really, did you already know about this project when we talked last year? Or was this I don't now know, the not, No, this, this had not, this had not uh, come up yet. Um, so I still have, so uh, the film that I may have mentioned, um, yep. um, that is moving forward. Um, on several different levels. So please stay tuned to that. I'm coming back and we're going to talk about that because we're going to get that movie made and the, the yes. world needs to see it. Good. The world needs to see it. Um, so that's the biggest thing on the horizon. Um, I'm actually supposed to go to, uh, I've got a couple of things coming up. There's actually something, um, a new show about Bobby Darren, which is, um, which uh, I'm working on a development project for that as well. Um, a new possible Broadway show with some pretty big Broadway names 
Um, that that might be coming up, and then I might be going back. I might get pulled back into Jersey Boys at some point um, in the <laughs> in the next couple of months too. So we'll we'll see. Um, so you're yeah. replaying Sunny. Yeah. Jersey Boys, you just mentioned. Yeah. You've had some great runs as we talked about. Greece, yeah. of course. Right. These if you made an off Italian guy in musical theater, I'm your guy. Right, right, right. <laughs> Who's your favorite character? Who would you like Sonny. to rephrase? I think Sonny would be. I think Sonny's the, the deepest. I mean, I always wanted to do Danny Zuko um, growing up. I always wanted to, to play, to be in Greece and to play Danny. I've done that. Um, but Sonny has more levels and Sonny's a little, you know, is, is, is a more three-dimensional character and, um, and the music is great. And no, I love playing the role. I really do. Um, Jersey boy is a great show. Um, but as far as the character that I play, which is usually the, the mob boss, Chip DiCarlo, um, <laughs> there's not a lot, you know, it's, I can do that and, you know, <laughs> there, there, there may or may not have been a sighting of me in the middle of that show when I was in Vegas in, at the craps table in between scenes. There may or may not have been. There may or may not prove or disapprove. Yeah, yeah. As we wind down, you're coming down to closing weekend. Yeah. I reached out to you when I first heard this. Congratulations. You were so excited jumping into this. Here you go. The curtain's going to fall. Yeah. What does this experience mean for you? Oh, it means a lot. It means um, it means that I feel like um, I finally feel like I mean this is like personal, so I don't know if anybody cares, but uh, I finally feel like I'm able to um, impart. You know, you I don't like being the guy that constantly implements other people's decisions. I like to make decisions. I, I you know. I like to make choices and and have them implemented and see if they can work. And for the first time in a long time, um, I'm not the guy who's just standing where someone tells me to stand and, and saying what they tell me to say. I'm actually creating something. And um, so this has been an opportunity with Janine. Thank you to Janine for, for asking me to do this, to be a part of this with her. Um, for me to create something and not just to implement others' decisions. And that is much more exciting to me than just walking on stage and, and any even any applause. Because any applause that anybody gets, you feel like I help to contribute to that. Um, and if anybody is touched by anyone in the show, by any moment in the show, I feel like I help to create that moment. And, um, and that's much more exciting to me than getting the personal accolades. Joe, Barbara, great to have you back on the show. And again, we will stay in touch because you got a movie project. And you, you got something else to talk about. Oh, come on, Rich. That's going to be a big one. Looking forward to it, my friend. Joe, thanks for being here. Thank you, me. Rich. Wow. The Bronx Tale, all the things going on. Keegan with us here today to talk about his experience. And that's going to do it for this edition of Rock the Stage Show. We're back here every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time. And again, we're streaming on the PPN Network, going around the world now in 17 different countries and expanding. And of course, you can always find our shows as well on YouTube. Join us Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time for our premiere parties. Until then, I'm the Trigger, Rich Bound Trigger. We'll see you back here next Sunday for another edition of Rock the State Show.